Just waiting for her to get set. Is she set now? Are you ready? Good morning, good children of God. Welcome as we continue in our journey of Advent, as we move toward the day when we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is only two weeks away. Isn't it amazing how we all go, oh, it, it's catching up on us. It catches us by surprise. Um, are any of you, for as long as you've been alive, has Christmas been on the 25th of December? Every year. Shouldn't catch you by surprise, but it does, doesn't it? So, but uh, oh, this year it is coming quite quickly. So I would ask you please take a look at some of the announcements in the bullet bulletin of following worship this morning. Uh, they'll be wrapping candles downstairs in the Matthew room. Anybody interested in learning how to wrap candles? If you, I should say how, to, how we wrap candles. Uh, you can join the group down there. Uh, also, this afternoon, uh, or later today, DeForest, Christian Faith Moravian Church in DeForest will be having their blue Christmas service. Um, for those who, Christmas isn't always the greatest time of the year. So um, please, please, uh, if you have a chance, go that this afternoon. Um, there was a group here Friday doing, doing uh, blankets for hospice. I heard you got one done, Diane? Yeah, we did. Got one done? Um, so, but uh, certainly they can use more help. They'll be doing it on the Fridays, you see there, and Tuesdays as well. So, um, yeah, on the 19th, uh, they'll be in the, the, the Fellowship Hall because apparently they didn't want to try to be tying those things while people are throwing darts. I thought it'd be kind of, I mean, this, those are soft, right? You could catch, catch darts with them. Um, or perhaps Kenny, where's Kenny go? He was there. Kenny, maybe you could, you could uh, incorporate some of those people who are tying those things. They could throw darts in between the tying parts. What do you think, Diane? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tomorrow will be the last day to get some uh, funds in to help out with Christmas hams. So anywhere from 10 to $12, the Stewardship Outreach has already purchased uh, a thou or excuse me, I was going to say a thousand hams, a hundred hams uh, to be distributed. So please help out the, uh, with that. There are two bins, uh, one by the bulletin board that is for personal care products as well as cleaning products for the, uh, for the um, food pantry. And there's a barrel that the fire department has for foodstuffs. So um, if you have anything, one of those, pick, pick, pick something if you're at the store, grab an extra thing and throw it in one of the bins when you come to church. Uh, they'll be picking up the personal supplies next week. And I believe the, um, the food barrel is the 20th, which is that week before, before Christmas. I'm not sure that, is that in here? Yes, the 20th. Are there any other announcements this morning? If you wrap candles, they'll feed you. And, and for those of you who thought that our Christmas tree only had white lights on it, The problem is, the problem is going to be is that my boys are sitting up here and they're going to get so enamored watching the lights in the tree, they won't be listening to me. Isn't that right, boys? <laughs> Who said what? <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be, yeah, it wouldn't be the first time they watched right, lights rather than listen to me. So, uh, also, uh, happy birthday, Joe. Joe Stokes' birthday today. And it just so happens she is the same age as Ada Gullickson in the back. Right, Ada? 
You and Joe are the same age? Stand up once, everybody knows who you are back there. There's Ada, yay! You and Joe are the same age, right? Joe? What was that? Sure, okay. <clears throat> On the second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. In Titus 2.13, Paul explains that the grace of God teaches us many things, including looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking, watching, understanding. This is what the wise men did. They saw the star and understood its meaning. 1 Peter 1.13 states, Gird up the loins of your minds, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Watch what happens when the eyes become blind to the hope of the promise. Right up there, look! You're right, there is a new star. Where? Where? Up there! I don't see it. Have I taught you nothing? Look west from the North Star. What do you see? A bunch of little lights. But amid those little lights is one that's really bright and new. What is it? Uh... <clears throat> it's so obvious. The moon. No. Look at the North Star. You got it? Uh-huh. <clears throat> now, look down three stars. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> now, it's the second star on the right. And straight on till morning. No! Bob, here. Maybe you can see it with those. Uh, turn them around, would you please? All right. Hey, this is cool. Hi, Mrs. Hoyt. <laughs> Up there, <clears throat> look at the star in the sky. Oh. <clears throat> now, Bubba, what does a new star signify? Uh, a crowded universe. It means a king or someone of great significance has been born. I wonder where it could be. Judging from the star's location, Israel maybe? That looks about right. A king destined for greatness. We should pay our respects. Are you suggesting a journey? Why not? We are wise men. <laughs> it's our duty to officially honor the king. I can see it now. As we enter, enter his court, they'll announce us as the Magi from the East. Abdullah, Li Cheng, and uh, Bubba. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you know this thing makes the moon look like it has zits all over his face? Um. Your cousin, Akeem, is he available? Uh, quick, let's go ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. 
I could see a lot with this. Would you please stand and join me in our opening hymn? seated. <laughs> Under our uh, prayer concerns this morning, um, there's one missing in there. Uh, please keep in your prayers Nancy Nelson, Bruce's wife. Um, Nan, uh, Bruce sent out a text that said for her 66th birthday, she celebrated by getting pneumonia. Uh, she's been kind of wearing herself down a bit. Um, has been for the last three years, a lot of work uh, where she's at down in the hospital, um, but uh, she's picked up pneumonia, so please keep them in your prayers. Um, I assume she wants to get healed up well enough that they, I think they're traveling to Minnesota for Christmas this year um, as Brian's wife is pregnant, again, with their second child. So uh, please keep them in your prayers as they deal with that. Um, and of course, through her other her other work, <clears throat> um, Dina continues to heal well. Um, for those of you who uh, see her, did you even bring a cane this morning? Oh, you did bring it. Okay, she's been wandering around the house without a cane uh, a lot of the time, but uh, which is good for me because I, I can get closer to her now. She doesn't have something to swing at me, um, but uh, she's doing quite well. She had her staples out this past week. Um, which was uh, an interesting experience. Um, I thought, I offered. I said, I got a pair of vice grips in the garage. She didn't think much of that at all. Um, but uh, they took her staples out, but she still has a little bit of uh, pain, nerve pain down the lower part of her thigh. So, um, does that still hurt that way? It's better. So, um, she did, did say the pain was almost enough to make a preacher's wife swear. 
So, you know, if I told you if there was enough to make a preacher swear, you'd go, yeah, we well, can see that. Her, not so much. But um, <clears throat> please keep uh, Kelly Green is doing doing uh, well. Uh, Wayne Staff still awaiting a kidney. So please keep them in your prayers. Anna still hobbling around with a boot. How much longer for you, Anna, with the boot? Dina did, find, Dina did find out this week that she cannot go back to work until the 11th of January, uh, which disappointed her. She hoped she could go back after the first of the year. Um, but I can tell you right now, she's working very hard rehabbing because she'd like to go back to say Merry Christmas to her kids that she works with before Christmas. So is that correct, honey? Um, so <clears throat> are there any other prayer concerns? Or joys this morning. How's she doing with her new heart? And where's she at, Wendy? Oh, she is. Okay. Jane. Who does? Trudy Miller has COVID. At home, I assume. I, is she at home? Okay. Anyone else? Oh, Don's having a knee replacement this week. Uh, what day is that, Don? Tuesday. Tuesday. Having a knee replaced this week. So, which, now you've had one replaced already, right? So this is the other one. And then you'll be the bionic man. Is that how that works? You'll walk in the church going, no, 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 no. Yeah. What's that? Well, if I if I was actually funny, then it wouldn't it wouldn't be as good, you know, uh, unfortunately. Although I'm lame most of the time. You know, years ago, um, Dakota one time asked me, this is when he was quite a bit younger, he said, Dad, why is it I'm funny when I'm not trying to be, and I'm not funny when I am trying to be? And I said, welcome to the club. So that's the way it seems to work. Sorry. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, this day we all know of people, friends or family, who are in need of your healing touch. Those who are awaiting perhaps tests and results of those tests. Those who are undergoing surgery. Those who have had things replaced or simply taken out of their bodies. Our modern medicine is indeed a great gift from you, and yet there is so much more they do not understand. We thank you, Lord, during this season of Advent for the many variety of gifts you give to so many different people that can help these frail vessels our spirits have been placed into. Lord, this day we ask that you continue to watch over your world. We call this a season of peace, a season of hope. And yet we know there are places in the world where that is not true. We ask, Lord, that you may give all, all people, a sense of love that comes from you that we can give to each other as gifts. Lord, continue to shower us, continue to bless us, continue to lead us as we move forward in this season. Amen. May we now bring our tithes and offerings to God.
we thank you that in this season as we look forward to giving gifts that we can be gifts to others we can be gifts to those we come into contact with each and every day we can be the gift that shows them your love your compassion your grace we ask lord that you take the gifts that we have given back to you and use them even as you use us to further the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, the coming Prince of Peace in our world. Amen. Please be seated. Who's reading today? Ah. Huh? Go ahead. Morning. Bubba. my binoculars for these. From Isaiah chapter 40, the first verse. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear, say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and he recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother's sheep. And from Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will, re who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. 
Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Would you please turn to your bulletin and join me as we respond to the Isaiah passage? Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak unto them words of deliverance. Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak unto them words of peace. Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak unto them words of order. God will hallow the cause of the righteous. Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak unto them words of assurance. God will raise the eyes of the hopeless. Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak unto them words of blessing. Lord, give us faith and strength the road to build to see the promise of the day fulfilled when war shall be no more and strife shall cease upon the highway of the Prince of Peace. Then faith and hope will shake hands and love and justice will embrace. Amen. Have you ever been stuck in, uh, in traffic? Gridlock? Um... When Dean and I would drive back and forth to seminary, oftentimes we would get stuck at times in, um, you know, unfortunately in traffic. Um, I remember one time especially, uh, we were stuck at the Allegheny Tunnel on highway, which was interstate, it wasn't interstate then, it was the Pennsylvania Turnpike uh, 9. And um, we were there for, we were there long enough that we played about four games of cribbage. Um, you know, we, you talk about distracted driving now with phones, um, you know, back then, you know, we played cribbage in the car for crying out loud. Um, yeah. Uh, one day I was coming back into, into Bethlehem on Highway 22 um, from Reading where I was a student pastor and there had been a crash or something. So traffic is all backed up. This would have been the late 80s. So I'm sitting there for like three hours. Can you imagine nowadays? I mean, back then, you had nothing to do. You didn't have a cell phone you could call anybody and say, honey, I'm going to be a little late. You couldn't play any games. You couldn't talk to anybody. You just had to sit there. How boring, huh? Well, gridlock, unfortunately, doesn't seem to go away, does it? Um, even when we moved to, to Minnesota and would come to the forest for the, to visit mom and pop, it always seemed around Mauston, um, there were always construction going on. The interstate was always doing something, they were doing something there to build up the interstate or change it. By the way, anyone know why the interstate system was created in the first place? Or who had the idea for it? Thank you. Eisenhower. Some of you might remember him. Um, he, during World War II, found the Autobahn in Germany to be a wonderful piece of work and thought, this would work great in the United States. And, but originally, it was designed to be, to be able to move troops from one place to another quickly or to move people out of an area that would be uh, under attack or be having problems. And of course, we know how well that works, right? If any of you have ever uh, seen uh, uh, Florida interstate when there's a hurricane coming, you know how well the interstate moves all those cars out uh, in a timely manner. Right? Did you know that today there's about, oh, I think it's 16,000 miles of interstate highway in the United States? It's actually shrunk. Part of the reason it has shrunk is they've straightened parts of it out. 
We all know of roads that have been changed, right? They're changed for the betterment so that they, you can drive a little easier. You don't have to slow down so much, except for now they instituted those stupid roundabouts, right? You all love those, don't you? Um, but um, the interstate system, actually, if you go to Pennsylvania, um, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, US 76 from Harrisburg to Phil, uh, Pittsburgh, was the original superhighway of the United States. That was the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Or as my daughter refers to it, the Turnfish. <laughs> December, when we went out there for uh, um, our mission trip, she kept Turnpike. Well, Pike is a fish. It should be the Turnfish. And this is the daughter who now has a young son is teaching him. So let's hope the generations go a little better. Um, but the, that part of the Pennsylvania Turnpike was the original superhighway. They've straightened it out, though. There's actually places where you can go now off the beaten path of the, the main highway and see where the old highway went. There's still four lanes of road, the road to nowhere, and there's actually tunnels there, yep, besides. They're tourist attractions. They've actually used them for some of those apocalyptic movies that we see when the end of the world has come. They've used them for that. But we straighten out the roads because it makes it a little safer, right? Most of the time. We all know Highway 12 from Middleton to Sauk City. Used to be a god-awful highway. A lot of deaths out there in that piece of road. Now, much smoother travel. Highway 29 up uh, between Green Bay and Abbotsford was the same way. They straightened that out as well. Put nice four lanes in. One of the, one of the side effects, though, a lot of the small towns out along there are dying because nobody's driving through town anymore. They kind of missed that part of it. But there was a lot of, of people who were... Um, hurt in crashes or killed due to highways that weren't pleasant um, for people to travel a lot of cars on. Now, I like the old roads. Um, my grandparents lived down by Prairie du Chien. Uh, actually, their farm is about uh, less than 10 miles from where Carl Kutsky has a cabin. And I used to love those roads, you know, like they go on like this, that didn't have shoulders. You know, that you, that in the, in the wintertime, the snow banks would be taller than the cars. I liked it even better when I got my own license. And especially with my orange car, the supersonic. But they straighten the roads out to make them a tad bit safer. Now we build new roads and engineers go and they, I mean, you go to Milwaukee, they're, they're constantly building new intersections, making, widening out highways. Unfortunately, doing that, has it relieved gridlock at all? You know, a highway is much like a man's garage. The bigger you make it, the more stuff you stuff into it, right? You know, you will have as much stuff as you have room in your garage for, and then maybe a little bit more. I only thank my stars and my God that we have two small cars in my garage. Because if we had a full-size car from the 70s, I'm not sure we could fit it in there. But traffic hasn't slowed down because people understand that when a road gets rebuilt, there's more room to go, right? So more cars go on it. And of course, we all know that when, from back when we first started driving, there's far less cars driving the highway today now than there were then, right? Most of you growing up, how many cars did your parents have? One vehicle, right? We've always had no, we didn't. At seminary, we only had the one. But as soon as we got done with seminary, we got a second car. 
Fact is, at one point in Minnesota, I believe I had eight vehicles on my roster. I asked my insurance agent if I could get a fleet rate. Because at that time, with the kids all being only five and a half years apart, they're, they're all getting their driver's license, and they're all going different directions. Uh, Derek and Dara were at school uh, in, in uh, Rochester. Derek and Dakota in December were still going to high school. Um, so we were constantly getting cars. And of course, Dad, being the nice guy that he is, got a couple nice cars that unfortunately both got told within a span of about six weeks. Then I bought a $200 Dodge Spirit that if you pushed your foot on the passenger side of the floorboard, you'd start rubbing the front tire. <laughs> they drove that for one winter. <laughs> what? No, we only had it for one. We can discuss that later. Okay. What's your... <laughs> But Isaiah's talking about a highway. You know, the highway Isaiah talks about is not necessarily a super highway like we think in that terms, or even a highway that we think of, because generally speaking, when you build a highway, what do you do? You level things off, right? You make culverts, put bridges over things. Back in Isaiah's time, people had to go by what the landscape gave them. They couldn't necessarily, now granted they may have built, built some bridges, but otherwise you weren't going to mow down or mow down a mountain. You weren't going to tunnel through a mountain. You were going to go up and over the mountain if that's the way you were going to walk. <sighs> but Isaiah, and Isaiah here in this part of the scripture, um, most scholars believe that Isaiah is actually three different people, three different Isaiahs. Because the first part of Isaiah, up to about chapter 40, um, talks about the people before they are taken away. In about 600, uh, maybe a little before 600 B.C. This part talks about the redemption. It's, it's about five decades later. And this Isaiah is talking about the return that's coming close. The return is coming close. We're going to have a highway that God has built that we're going to go be able to go back home on. And then the last part of Isaiah, the last 10, 15 chapters, talks about being back. So there's a good possibility that we have three different authors under that same heading of Isaiah. But Isaiah here is talking about the road back home, the highway that has been built. Now, we think about building highways ourselves, right? As a rule, we don't just say the highway and it's going to happen. We forget that the highway Isaiah is talking about is the highway God has built. It's the road that God has built for us. Question for you. Even though we rebuild highways, is every person on the highway a careful, considerate driver? You can rebuild a highway, right? Can you change someone's driving habits? Isaiah's talking here about this is the highway, but somehow the people need to have a change of heart. Comfort my people, let them know their sin has been paid. Let them know they can be filled with joy once again. Let them know that their God is here. Let them rejoice. So God has built us a highway. Should we be driving on it? Should we be walking on it? Are we worthy?
that's a question we need to ask ourselves uh, as we prepare ourselves for the coming of the Christ. Are we worthy to receive that? Are we worthy to receive the greatest gift that God has to give to us, the gift of salvation? Are we worthy? Is this highway built for us? Should we be on it or should we take it a pit stop once in a while and figure out what we're doing? The majority of us, let's face it, you know, we, we kind of rush from place to place. Is there any of you who don't at some point wish you had less to do? Maybe I should turn that around. Is there any of you who wish you had more to do? I'm just not busy enough. I need more stuff to do. Anybody? Do any of us focus our energies on what God has called us to do? Is it just a sideline for us? Something we do when we have time. Do we have compassion on other people? Do we give them grace when it's convenient? Or all the time? Are we willing to speak of the love of our God when we feel comfortable doing it? Or at all times? If we're out traveling on this road, are we willing to bring others with us? Or do we travel alone in the carpool lane? Are we worthy to travel the highway God has built? And when I say we, and, and I, I know we all have a tendency to think that we as corporate. But what about you? Because I don't know if you know this or not, um, we might be together, the church, but we minister individually. That's like saying, we say about, we talk about um, how much we love the government. What is the government? The government is not a building, is it? Is it just a place over there? That, that's government? It's people. Right? The church is not just a place. It is a people. Individually. We individually, do we deserve to be on that road? Do we continue to do enough? I shouldn't say do enough. To do things, to do something to bring about change in other people's lives for the better. In the last couple of weeks, um, I've read some disturbing things. One was an article that said 12 reasons why you should not raise your children religiously why you should not bring your children up in the church the other one was um, talking about um, the de-Christianization of Christmas more and more people are fortunately are talking about us and our feeling that we have nothing to offer, nothing of any substance to offer our community, our world, our friends, our families. Do we? Do we show them the love? Do we tell them that it comes from our God? Do we show them grace? that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
do we show them that we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do things well beyond what we're capable of doing? Excuse me, do you? Do you have all of that? You are God's children. You are the beloved of God. You are the people empowered and gifted. Believe it or not, you don't have to stand up here to tell people about Jesus Christ. Fact is, studies will tell you, all of you can do it better than I can. Because you simply tell your story to people. You tell your story where you felt Christ moving in your life, where you felt God empowering you. Maybe even you tell your story about you remember Christmas Eve when you were a kid. Are there any of us who don't remember Christmas Eve holding those candles when we were younger that does not bring a smile back to our face? Or to watch our children or grandchildren? It isn't just a beautiful service. There's more to it than that. My friends, we are called to travel the highway. How we choose to travel that is up to us. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, you left the star out there for the wise men to follow. You didn't give them a lighted path, an easy highway. You simply left it out there. A way for them to go to find their way to get there. Perhaps each of us doesn't know exactly how we would tell others about you. Perhaps we have trouble understanding ourselves this faithfulness that we feel. It's okay. May we understand that you are simply with us each and every day. You wish, Lord, that none should be left behind. And so in this season of gifts, may we truly be gifts to those around us. To help them see the joy of being a follower of Jesus Christ. That it is not a burden, but a privilege to be a part of the body of Christ. That it is something we do because we choose to do it, not because we must. Lord, bless us for the journey ahead. Empower us with gifts. Send us. Amen. Would you please join me in hymn 264?
Would you please turn back to your bulletin as we prepare to come to Christ's table. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. We have been lukewarm disciples, lacking the zeal of John the Baptist. Our voices could cry out in the wilderness, but are weak and half-hearted. We could proclaim the gospel, but shrug and stammer. We could clothe ourselves in humility and faith, but look for power and prestige. We could give you the glory, but puff ourselves with pride. Forgive us, O oh God. Transform us for authentic and wholehearted discipleship. Advent is a season of waiting, a waiting that is anything but passive. To make room for Christ to dwell within us, we must acknowledge our own sin, which stands in the way of living the fullness of life God promises. Let us be truthful with God in the presence of one another. Let us give God the gift of our honest and humble confession. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Friends, believe the good news. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Happy birthday.
Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection. In the same way after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, drink of this, all of you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. And now whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give unto you his peace. In the name of Jesus, amen.